gives for energy? While being able to do all of the previous comparisons and discussions are really nice, we need a way to tell spontaneity when enthalpy and entropy disagree, where one points toward spontaneous and the other points toward non-spontaneous. It would also be nice if we had a more efficient way of looking at the discussion of spontaneity with some numbers. Gibbs free energy gives us both of these by relating the entropy and the enthalpy into one concept and one number. We can then tell the spontaneity of a process simply by looking at the sign of this one number, simplifying a lot of what we've just discussed. So let's talk about the Gibbs free energy. There's a lot of things that we're going to cover in this video, but they aren't generally too difficult for your students to grasp and generally is a pretty well liked section. So let's get started. We're going to define and get the definition for Gibbs free energy and use this to calculate the Gibbs free energy. This will be simplified and more inclusive way to tell if something is spontaneous or not. We aren't going to cover the derivation of the formula, though you are welcome to look it up in the book or come talk to me about it if you're interested, especially if you're planning on going into PCAM later on. Finally, we're going to use this formula to simplify the discussion of if something is likely to be spontaneous and at what temperatures. And finally, we will calculate the Gibbs free energy if we know the steps that add up to be the final reaction we're interested in. If we put all of our previous relationships together, we can get a new term, the Gibbs free energy. This is equal to the change in enthalpy minus the temperature times the change in entropy. This is defined as the amount of energy available to do work. To keep with the convention on signs, a negative dg, or negative delta g, is a release of energy and therefore is spontaneous. And a positive delta g takes energy in and is non-spontaneous. There are times that the Gibbs free energy could be zero. This is a special case called equilibrium, and you'll discuss that a lot more in a later class. But it's still worth mentioning that it is possible while we're talking about it here. Now let's talk about the mathematics of how to calculate this. Just like our other thermodynamic parameters that we've been discussing, our dg is equal to the products minus the reactants. Remembering to multiply by the coefficients, just like we did for dh and ds. Now let's look a bit more into the definition. I have defined it as the amount of energy available to do work. We can't simply use the enthalpy release to look at this because much of that enthalpy is used up in increasing the entropy of the surrounding universe, and some is lost as heat to the surroundings. The Gibbs free energy has the first two of these values both built in, so it tells us the maximum that is actually released or absorbed based on the enthalpy, the entropy, and the temperature. We can visualize this with this picture. We have our system, and it is perhaps, in this case, releasing energy. Some of it is used to change the entropy of the surroundings. Some of it is lost as heat to the surroundings. And the free energy is defined as that that's left over and available to do work after those other two parts have been completed. And this is what the equation has in it. So let's do a problem now. Here I ask you to calculate delta G based on the information given. I give you the enthalpy and the entropy values. I don't give you the delta G values. So you need to use the equation that I introduced in this video to calculate it. Then you need to calculate the dH and the dS to fill into this equation. Let's start with the dH. Calculate the change in entropy before moving on in the video. That's not new to this section, so you should be able to do it from previous parts. So calculate the change in enthalpy and the change in entropy, and then come back. So let's start this. The reaction is balanced, and it has a 1 to 1 to 1 ratio. So we don't even have to worry about coefficients this time. We just need to fill in. If we fill in our dH of products and our dH of the reactants, we will get 179.2 kilojoules per mole. Be really careful to pay attention to the units here. We get kilojoules per mole. Now let's do the entropy. If you haven't already, make sure you do this before moving on. Once again, we add up our products and add up our reactants 
We put these together to get our answer of 160.2 joules per mole. Now, quickly either remember back or look at the table here and think about what our units for enthalpy was. How does that compare to our entropy units? Our enthalpy we did in kilojoules, and this one is in moles, or in joules. This isn't done to trick you. Rather, these are the typical units that they are tabulated in. Generally, it makes for prettier numbers if we use kilojoules for enthalpy and we use joules for entropy. But before filling into the Gibbs free energy, you must convert them into the same unit. It doesn't even matter which one you do, so long as they are the same. Typically, the Gibbs free energy is pretty large, and they're generally therefore reported in kilojoules per mole. And so we're going to go ahead and convert our entropy into kilojoules per mole, as I've done here, before moving forward. If you had chosen to do it in joules per mole, and you had chosen to do enthalpy in joules per mole, that would have been okay too. All we have left now that we have our two values is to fill into the free energy equation. So take a minute and do this yourself before moving on. We fill in our 179.2 and the 0.1602. We have our units matching so we can keep moving forward. Once we type this in and we solve, we get our Gibbs free energy of 131.5 kilojoules per mole. And because it is positive, it means that the reaction is non-spontaneous at this temperature. These next couple of slides aren't anything particularly new, but it does formalize and help us discuss how, in some cases, we can tell if a reaction is spontaneous by quickly looking at the signs. We have done this in previous videos just without looking at quite the mathematics and instead using conceptual concepts. We already discussed this a bit, so now we'll do it this way. Let's first look at the most straightforward cases. If the sign of DH is negative, the first term is negative. If the sign of DS is positive, then the second term is negative as well because there's a negative in the equation. This would mean that both terms are negative. If both terms are negative, then the overall DG must also be negative and therefore is spontaneous in all cases. Now let's look at the second line. If dH is positive, the first term of this equation must be positive. If dS is negative, then the second term must also be positive, since two negatives equal a positive. If both of these terms are positive, when you add them together, you're going to have a positive value, which means that dG must be positive. This means that it is non-spontaneous at all conditions. So by quickly looking at these sets of signs, you can decide if something is always spontaneous or never spontaneous. But there's two more things that we need to worry about. They get a little trickier if both enthalpy and entropy are conflicting. In those cases, one term is positive and one term will be negative. Whether the process is spontaneous then depends on how the dH and the dS relate and the temperature. Since the dS is multiplied by the temperature, the temperature will have an effect on the second term. The higher the temperature, the more the entropic term matters, or the more the second term, or the T delta S, whichever way you want to think about it, the more that that term matters. The lower the temperature, the lower that the entropic term matters. So, if both dH and dS are negative, then at low temperatures, it will be spontaneous because the first term will dominate. That negative delta H will dominate. But if the temperature gets too much higher, it will unbalance it so that the second term will start to dominate. And if that second term dominates, then dG will become positive and therefore non-spontaneous. Now, the opposite is true if both dH and dS are positive. At low temperatures, because the dH dominates, that first term dominates, the dG will be positive and the process will be non-spontaneous. As the temperature increases and you reach a high temperature, the second term will start to dominate. Once the entropic term dominates, this makes the dG negative because the second term is negative, and therefore the process is spontaneous. You should think about this couple of slides a few times through 
and maybe rewatch the video. There's a lot of positives and negatives, and it might take you a few times through to really get it. Now, if you're following along in your book, you'll notice that we did skip all of the sections having to do with equilibrium in this section. And that's because we choose to do that portion after you learn equilibrium. So in whatever class you learn equilibrium, you will do the last two sections of this chapter in that area as well. Now let's do a quick review about Gibbs free energy. Gibbs free energy is the amount of energy available to do work. We can calculate it in two ways. We can do products minus reactants, which I didn't do here because you can do that on your own. Or we can do delta H minus T delta S, which is the example we did. We can use the above equation to describe if the re reaction is always or never spontaneous or how that spontaneity is related to temperature based on the signs of DH and DS.